Hello everybody, um, my name's Raymond Morell. I'm a Unite shop steward or union rep, long-time friend and comrade uh, Neil Davidson. And before we start tonight's meeting, I just want to make a few remarks about the Neil Davidson Legacy Project. There's a team that is working on this project, which has essentially three strands to it. The first is to prepare the remainder of Neil's work for publication, make his uh, extensive library available to the movement in Edinburgh and Scotland, and to support further academic research uh, with uh, the work around the Neil Davidson Fellowship. Now, each of these are in themselves distinct projects, but they're all related. They bring together Neil's work and his, his activism. So the published work that has been uh, published so far is uh, the Brazilian Portuguese translation of essays on uneven combined development and modernism. This is some work that Raquel herself is familiar with. Essays on the uh, general strike in 1820 in the west of Scotland. The collection of essays on revolutionary rehearsals in the neoliberal age. Scotland after Britain, Britain after Europe. So th these are works that have been published already. The work in hand includes the uneven and combined development reader, Beyond the Bourgeois Revolutions. This is Neil's response to reviews of his uh, book, How Revolutionary Were the Bourgeois Revolutions? And What Was Neoliberalism? Now, Neil kept a copy of every book or journal that contained his work, and this has been updated with the posthumous publications, and Kathy Neil's partner is keeping that uh, up to date at this point in time. The intention will be to reunite all of Neil's work with his extensive library. Now, the library project itself has produced a, a full online catalogue of all of Neil's extensive library. And we intend to expand what the basement in White House books for to house that library and uh, create a, a large venue or meeting area for, for comrades and people in the movement for to utilize that library. And the third and final aspect of the uh, project is Neil Davidson's postdoctoral writing fellowship at Glasgow University where uh, Neil worked. And the fellowship's intended to support the early career researchers whose work seeks to extend and develop radical critical theory. So we are looking to hold a public event. It was planned initially for the 29th of November, but I think we're possibly going to move that on. We wanted just to make people aware that we are continuing to work on Neil Davidson's legacy. And if people want to help or support us, um, Pete Cannell has got a, you know, a sign-up sheet. And if uh, people want to add their names to that, you'd be more than welcome to join the team that's working on those aspects of Neil's legacy. So I'd just like to welcome uh, Raquel Varela, the author of People's History of Europe, amongst others. And if you could just give her a, an Edinburgh welcome, that'd be really appreciated. <laughs> Well, I found it. Well, first of all, thank you so much. And I'm sorry for my broken English, uh, but I will do my best uh, to make myself understandable for you. It's lovely to be here, especially in this homage to Neil. It's OK like this? Uh, nearby? Yeah, it's like this. It's better. Yeah, wonderful. Um, it's. Uh, 
also in a, we are in a very special moment, which is the, the struggle against the genocide in Gaza. Yesterday we had the chance to be in that wonderful demonstration in London. It was absolutely impressive to see so many people, so many people from all kinds of ages and religious and non-religious and different parties and uh, unions, etc. So it was absolutely inspired. And uh, this has, I think, a lot to do with what uh, uh, we are doing his, here today in this homenage to Neil, because uh, probably I think all of you know him. He was a brilliant Marxist historian, a socialist, an activist, a militant, and an organizer. Uh, he was also a profoundly erudite, so his books are not just uh, books that try to deal in an incredibly honest way with hypotheses to explain capitalism and the transformation of societies towards uh, socialism or not, uh, but they, uh, they, um, they, they use uh, the way he writes is not uh, this uh, tough, academic, uh, impossible writing. It's uh, um, it's someone is an intellectual committed to make himself understandable to a large public, and to make the debates he wanted uh, um, uh, accessible to a large public. Also, Neil uh, manage uh, very well not just uh, classical social history, but the relation with arts, with culture, etc. Uh, he has a huge inspiration in classic Marxism, uh, in Marx, in Engels, in Trotsky, in Rosa Luxemburg, in Gramsci, I shall underline as well, in Walter Benjamin, in Lukács. So he has, um, he uh, belongs to this group of intellectual Marxists and socialists that tries to deal with the society as a whole in a non-dogmatic way. <coughs> uh, I wanted to speak about a book that is not published in English, as far as I understood. It's published in Portuguese, <laughs> because uh, uh, in Brazil, uh, Neil has given a course and uh, wrote a, a group of articles on the endeavor and combined development. And uh, uh, Luis Renato Martins, that sends his regards to the audience, uh, and also Ricardo Antunes, a very important Brazilian sociologist who has made the uh, preface to the book, uh, they put it together, all these articles, to make a book called The Uneven and Combined Development, which I will try a little bit to bring you today and leave some questions open for our debate, which I think is the most important thing. So, the uneven and combined development uh, theory was developed in the first generation of Marxists, so they always dealt with the question of different developments among the countries and how would socialists deal with this. Trotsky, in the Russian, uh, concerning the Russia situation, will underline the question of combined development, not just uneven development, but combined development. And the main idea, if I may make it very simple, maybe too simple, was that uh, countries that were not as developed as the core countries of capitalism, like traditionally, of course, England, but not just England, would not need to uh, go through the same stages of development as the core capitalist countries uh, to, uh, uh, to reach a stage, I don't even like the word stage, not even Trotsky, of course, where a socialist revolution would be possible. So the main idea is that uh, the, the, the market, the world market and the capitalism brings uh, to backward countries, backwardness countries, brings uh, uh, extremely developed elements. Uh, I can give you a concrete example concerning the relation between Portugal, where I come from, and England. Portugal has always been a kind of semi-peripheral country, a kind of a protectorate of Britain, 
concerning economic uh, everything in Portugal was built with investment banks, machines from Portugal, from uh, Britain to, to, to Portugal. Uh, the famous uh, theory of Adam Smith, uh, which is uh, making blood around the world in the last uh, uh, hundreds of years, was made upon the unequal change between Portugal and England concerning the commerce of trade and wine. So Portugal, uh, sorry? Uh, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, David Ricardo, uh, the, the theory from David Ricardo. I was thinking of Adam Smith because I'm in Scotland. Uh, of David Ricardo, uh, the idea was that uh, Portugal would be specialized in exporting wine because they, they do it cheaper, and in exchange they would buy uh, um, uh, textiles from England. This, this theory, uh, comparative advantage, has been, of course, uh, developed in, uh, uh, it's an imperialist theory, has no economic uh, rationality apart from the profitability of the core countries, but still today makes uh, the most, uh, has the most terrible consequences as you go to Brazil and uh, I think 40 million people are now in hunger in Brazil, as far as I remember, and it's the biggest export of soya towards other countries. So the, the land is not uh, producing what people need, it's producing what is more profitable in the world market, if you think on coffee or in Ethiopia, if you think on tea or whatever. So this, um, the, uh, this is the 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 main explanation. So, uh, but Portugal in uh, 1870 uh, had uh, uh, started the, in Portugal the organization of the working classes influenced by the Paris Commune because the Portuguese uh, workers uh, leaders, they were in, the, in Paris they have lived and experienced uh, either directly or by influence the revolutions in the 1830, 1848, the, Paris, the, the foundation of the International Workers' Organization in 64, and then the Paris Commune. So Portugal, which was an extremely backward country with uh, uh, the majority of the population in the countryside working as peasants, uh, more than 80% of the population by the time was uh, an alphabet, they immediately ins were inspired by the Paris Commune and have uh, created a branch of the uh, Workers' Fraternity, of the International Workers' Organization, which, uh, made, uh, which had a, a huge impact in the, the Workers' Organization, and it will be one of the main countries in the late 19th century of the revolutionary syndicalism, apart with, together with France, with Spain, also a little bit in US, etc. So this is an example, uh, but of course the examples that are most well known and that Neil develops is the example of Russia, which of course it was uh, one of the, from the point of view of the state, it was one of the backwards, uh, it was the, the most oriental empire in Europe. It's very interesting to say it now because it seems that Russia is not be doesn't belong to Europe anymore, uh, which is, of course, very ridiculous from the, every point of view, either geographic, political, or whatever. Uh, but uh, it was clear at the time that Russia was part of Europe, but had a kind of an oriental state, a brutal, czarist, repressive state. At the same time, it, has, it had one of the most concentrated and developed uh, proletarium of, of the world, and it was the fifth or the sixth, as far as I remember, uh, 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 concerning the production, the industrial production, but highly concentrated in St. Petersburg, Moscow, and the Ural, Ural area. So how all this is combined to bring the first revolution after the Paris Commune that is successively takes the power, the first social revolution. This this dialectic of uh, uh, how uh, uh, advanced and backward uh, uh, facts, qualities uh, uh, com are combined in one country. 
Niels uh, picks up this analysis to bring us uh, to nowadays hypothesis of the revolution. And of course, not of course, but uh, uh, he goes uh, to China. Uh, uh, so uh, the, his remarks are, how can we think about the uneven and combined development nowadays, and especially concerning one country, which is China? What's going on in China, and, and how China can help us to understand if this makes sense or not? Let's say that a new debate with uh, uh, different uh, uh, hypotheses of uneven and combined development, and he underlines the idea that the question of an even and combined developed is not a specific uh, method of analysis or characteristic of the modernity of capitalism. And there is a debate over the question of if there is a, uh, if we can equalize modernity and capitalism, which uh, in his opinion, no. But going back to China, going back to, uh, to China, going back to the uneven and combined development, he defends that the uneven and combined development is a, a, a characteristic of the societies prior to capitalism. But his main analysis is focused on, uh, in, his, in this book, of course, as it was uh, said here before, uh, this is, I'm, I'm picking up one book, one analysis, but Neil has written uh, immensely on many things, and also, of course, on the national uh, question and on the national revolution in Scotland, and how, and on the national, on the bourgeoisie revolutions, and the question on transition uh, uh, of capitalism, uh, from feudalism to capitalism. So, uh, he, 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 the big question he makes is, uh, he says that an even and combined development, it's something that makes all sense to know nowadays, to debate nowadays, because if I, I quote directly his words, where there is still a peasant, an even and combined development theory makes sense. When there is still parts of pre-capitalist, in capitalism, where there is, when there is uh, forms of uh, backwardness development with most advanced society, we find uh, open the we find the contradictions that open that uh, allowed a socialist uh, revolution, which does not depend on the even and combined development directly. It, this is a condition of analysis. It depends, above all, on subjective factors, on the organization of the working class, on the leaderships, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, his uh, remarks on China are extremely interesting, uh, where he defends that, first of all, China has one of the, it has the biggest proletarium in the world, and has experienced a dramatic and drastic transformation of peasants into workers in, on the process of migration from countryside to the city and to the factories. So, this is, the first, uh, the first uh, note on China to be analyzed. The second one, I uh, uh, don't want to lose myself, the second one is the forms of resistance of these workers. So, he, he inspired by many works, he, he underlines the level of struggles of, in, of the working class in China. And, uh, uh, and this unfortunately took place after his tragic uh, death, uh, which was suddenly and in the, I don't know exactly how to say this in English, but in a moment where you can produce more intellectually, he was six, just 62 years old. So it is the moment of more, when, you, when we are probably more mature to produce uh, to thought for the mind. Um, he, he was not here to experience that uh, during the last uh, lockdown in China, uh, in the last Christmas, the Foxcom workers uh, that are hundreds of thousands, sometimes can reach over a million workers, they were locked down 
because of COVID. But it was realized by the workers, they were locked down because there was a high demand of iPhones in the world market. And the lockdown was an excuse to oblige them to stay in the factory and work night and day, night and day. And there was an uprising in a Foxcom, which had spread to other factories in China. And uh, uh, there was uh, 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 these Bonapartist measures, which was supposed uh, they allegedly were used as a public health measure, but they were being used to repress workers' organization in China. And there was a, a building where people died because they were locked down and there was a fire, they could not go out. And this led the Chinese government to end the lockdown restrictions. And all this has started in a massive wildcat strike, no organized, uh, although with all the repression uh, uh, and was organized mainly by um, uh, precarious workers. So this was not the, the workers fixed uh, in the Foxcom, but the workers that were recruited to the high demands of Christmas iPhones uh, selling. Uh, this is just one example. Uh, and after that, the Chinese government never used uh, this uh, uh, lockdowns, forbidden uh, strikes, or obliging workers to stay in the factories. This shows just when it, one example the, uh, how uh, the movements of resistance in China can reach huge levels that we don't even know. Uh, uh, in 2008 or 2010, in, uh, China was the country in the whole world with more strikes. And uh, after these strikes, the wages have ris risen 25%, which had impact also in the European and Western countries because all the labor restructuring in the 70s, and especially after the defeat of the minor strike and other strikes in Europe uh, in the 80s, was based on the idea that the supply of the reproduction uh, goods of the workers would be made using uh, extremely cheap work from, ch work from China. So uh, the clothes the working class uses in Europe, uh, the tools for the kitchen or even the, the uh, um, domestic uh, washing machine, all these kind of things. I don't know the word in English, sorry. So all the things that are the consumption of the working classes, because the working classes don't buy high cars or whatever. The working classes spend the majority of the money in housing, food, and in these kind of, of product, products that are essential to the reproduction of the workforce. Of course, this has increased, which has led to pauperization of the working classes uh, in Europe. Just to show how the socialization of the production worldwide that exists today, which is which has the huge contradiction of the private appropriation of this socialization, uh, makes all the workers in the world together uh, uh, in an entanglement way. In a, uh, entanglement is a good word. It's like what happens in China has impact here immediately. What happens here has impact in China. We live in a, we live in a world where just-in-time production and delocation have made the companies, in principle, uh, very uh, strong because they can use social dumping, uh, migration, uh, uh, wars, uh, refugees, and all of that to cut uh, the, the wages. But at the same time, it has a huge potential if this working class organizes worldwide. Uh, some years ago, there was a, a strike in the uh, US, there was a strike in Brazil that has stopped the production of a full automobile industry in the US, because there was a little piece of the chain that was just built in Brazil. And nowadays, in fact, this is happening all around the world. And the biggest problem, of course, is, uh, is that you do there is no organization of the working class, in a sense, capable of organizing this, um, uh, uh, especially among unions. In fact, there are 
workers' organization and unions' organization, which have huge power, but they are highly bureaucrat bureaucratic unions, and they use their organization to do charity, to do all kinds of uh, assistance, but not to organize the workers worldwide in the sense of struggle. So the problem is not just that we don't have organizations. The unions nowadays, like ITF, for example, which is the International Transport Organization, they could do this very easy at any moment. I was once in a, in a, involved in a docker strike uh, where the dockers in Denmark they blockade the precarious work loaded, the, 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 the containers loaded by precarious work in Lisbon, and this was just enough for the Portuguese workers to win their strike, just because of a blockade in Denmark. So it's a, it's, the, the hypotheses are huge. That's why it's so important to study the even in combined development, not just because of the, the difference between the countries, but the relation between the countries, which I think Neil uh, brings as well. I shall underline as well, oh, the last remark on China that Neil makes, which uh, makes, um, which opens the possibility of uh, a revolutionary situation in China, is the level of state repression. So we have a conditions uh, that on, on one way we have a huge proletarium, on the other way we have a, in very important struggles, and on the other way we have a huge repression. We have a state that basically repressed the workers. And in, in these contradictions, uh, Neil sees uh, uh, possibilities against, is not a dogmatic conclusion, is um, open, uh, open uh, possibilities. Uh, I, I want to uh, also say something which I think it's very important. Two things, and I, I finished to open the debate, otherwise you'll be tired of listening to me. Did I spoke already? Half an hour, really? Almost. Oh my God. You cannot uh, allow me to speak so much. Uh, one thing which I find fascinating is uh, that Neil's study in the, his study on the revolution, on the bourgeoisie revolutions, is that somehow the counter-revolutions in Russia and in China have finished what the bourgeoisie revolutions could not. So they function, not the revolutionary moments, but the counter-revolutionary moments, mainly Soviet Union after the Stalinization in 28 and uh, China after 78. What they do is uh, they, uh, finish the uh, nation state modernity towards uh, commodification of uh, the entire society. So it's like, uh, uh, it's uh, uh, how history takes, goes in a way that was not, um, uh, that uh, was not expected. And the other notion of an even and combined develop, which I think it's so important, is that sometimes there is a kind of um, linear approach to an even and combined development that says that, look, the backward countries can have the, the most developed tools of the forward countries in order to make their revolution. Uh, so it looks a little bit optimistic. It's always in a positive way. And I want to underline the negative way, which is uh, when Stalin went to power, it was not just uh, the end, the defeat of the Russian, Rev the defeat of the German revolution, which had an impact of, which had made possible for Stalin going to power. When Stalin went to power, the backwardness of the Soviet Union also had an impact in the Western countries. So usually we underline how important was the defeat of the German Revolution to the defeat of socialism and the Bolsheviks in Russia. And we forget how, not just how the backwardness can have the best of the development, we forget that sometimes history is, is a, history 
plays a lot with us. The, the most uh, uh, developed countries also in, uh, uh, breathe the backwardness. Do you understand my argument? Is that the impact of Stalinism in the communist parties and in the workers' organization in the most developed countries was devastated. Was not just, uh, uh, um, the movement was not just a movement towards development. It was a movement towards regression. And that, uh, I think, it's something we should explore more when we think on societies today. And I think the Niels Davison contribution is absolutely essential and is incredible, vivid, uh, non-dogmatic, and um, uh, so much focus on something very important. And I finished here. The notion of permanent revolution is not the revolution, the democratic revolution that turns into social revolution, is not the national revolution that turns into international revolution. It's a revolution, it's a total revolution in the way of life. And Trotsky was very faithful to the idea that socialism is not just about changing, uh, uh, um, changing production or property. It's about changing in its entire mode, a way of life. And I think when Neo goes, is inspired by Rosa Luxemburg, by Lukacs, by Gramsci, is also uh, is also bringing the best tradition of. Trotskyism or critical Marxism or revolutionary Marxism, which is when we speak about revolution, we speak about an entire transformation of humans, including in our subjectivity. Thank you very much and sorry for my English again. <laughs>
non non religious people and Muslims, etc. Where is our aspir where is our indication that is that is that theory a, a useful tool to to look with optimism as well as um, horror horror at what's what's happening? Sorry for going on. Shall I answer now, or can we collect more? Uh, it's I, I, however you want. To, if you want to collect more questions and I, answer in I the round, I would prefer that okay. we collect more. Is okay? Yeah. Because sometimes you may also answer to the question. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I've got a, just a little a comment, um, more to do with uh, Neil's work, and then maybe a point of clarification if I might. Um, I, th I think the work that you're referring to by Neil, at least in English, was publicised in a series of essays online, uh, just so people know. Uh, Neil, Neil was sort of like that. He'd, his comedies would sort of, yeah, talk about everything in the pub with him, and then you'd find out he'd written a book in Portuguese that nobody ever heard about. But yeah, these essays, I think, are available in English, and maybe not with the, the full... Okay. Um, um, the full... Uh, the rest of the stuff that's in the book in Portuguese, which we look yeah. forward to being published in English. But um, um, uh, funnily enough, I think my point of clarification um, comes from the fact that I didn't actually get to the end of the essays because they were very long as well. And if, if, um, I seem to remember um, one of the footnotes in the essay to, to explain um, what uneven and combined development might be was a reference to J.G. Ballard's book, um, The Empire of the Sun. Um, which is a like, sort of semi-biographical book about growing up in China as a child and experiencing the war there, which is a fascinating book. And I obviously got distracted by that footnote and read the blue and book instead of finishing the essay. Um, but anyway, just to, again, to, to go to your point about China, um, what, what I thought you said was um, Neil's view of uneven and combined development it was that it was a historical concept that might, given that capitalism is now um, extended throughout the world, that there's no real uh, existing peasantry, peasant society at least, anymore. That it was maybe, maybe a, a concept that is, it isn't di is directly applicable to the, the current world. But y your comments about China seem to me to be actually explaining, with the explosivity of the strikes in China, for example, seem to be an application of that concept. So I wondered if, if, if I've misunderstood that mm -hmm. um, particular part of. Um, of the concept, because I do remember there was something about you know, you know, countries that seem very backwards and in inverted commas suddenly coming on the scene and you know showing the way as the Russian Revolution did to the to the global working class, um, uh, showing the way to 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 the world if you like for the, the if you're inside the workers that is of course. So yeah, I wondered if you could expand on that perhaps. Mm -hmm. I have a question. You're from Portugal. Was uh, Salazar's regime more bloodthirsty than Franco's regime? Hello. Thank you for speaking. Thank you for taking the time to come speak with us. Um, I think I speak for the audience when I say that despite the language barriers, what you've said has come across incredibly graciously and, and in a way that I feel would be very generative for further thought. Um, I think I have maybe a clarifying question or, a, yeah, let's call it a clarifying question, to the term of backwardness. I think specifically as a term maybe for you as the guest but also to the audience, who defines what we see as backward? Mm -hmm. And maybe if there is terminology that could be maybe more concise or more attached to material realities that describe the experiences of societies that we see as quote unquote backwards and whether or not we could maybe clarify what we mean by that when we discuss these movements. Thank you. Well, oh, I already have a lots of questions. 
Frank and Salazar were the, actually uh, the same regime, in our opinion. Uh, um, I just uh, published a People's History of Portugal this week with my husband that is here, sociologist, and we have this opinion. We have the opinion that there is a nationalist uh, historiography that don't look to the Iberian Peninsula as a whole, but we do. And Franco and Salazar, they were in the interdependent. They went to, the, they went to power uh, in a way that there was, it was dependent on each other. So when you had the uprising in Asturias, we had the uprising in Marina Grande. When the Spanish Civil War, when the revolution in uh, Spain began, Salazar was already repressing the revolutionaries and the, I, the uh, Iberists and Ar the anarchists because there was a strong Iberian anarchism. Uh, and uh, even the troops of Franco could not go from the south to, to uh, the center or, or in the border if Salazar wouldn't have helped. In, so, uh, and the defeat of the um, Spanish Revolution was essential to explain the Salazar uh, continuity in power. And after the, uh, during the Second World War, it was absolutely clear for England and France that uh, Franco and Salazar should not join officially the Allies because this could uh, have brought a new moment of a socialist revolution in Iberian Peninsula. So, and, and it's true that uh, it was, a, let's say, an hypothesis of the bourgeoisie that came, became very clear after the Second World War because they have become pro-anti-communist regimes supported by NATO and all the democracies in Europe. And so the dictatorships just ended when the anti-colonial revolutions in Guinea, Mozambique and Angola started. Uh, in 61, and after 13 years of colonial war and anti-colonial revolutions that defeated the colonial war, there was the Carnation Revolution, and Franco could not survive to the Carnation Revolution, as well as the coronel dictatorship in Greece. So, uh, these dictatorships are dictatorships that we consider in the same concept as Neil's use of passive revolution from Gramsci. They are a kind of revolutions from above. Uh, from uh, above, from the top above, do we say? <laughs> so it's uh, like revolutions without revolutions. It's a way of uh, finishing the nation state of the bourgeoisie and the Spanish revolution, uh, 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 bourgeoisie by an authoritarian regime near to fascism. Catholicism. Well, they were regimes, definitely they were fascist regimes, uh, which... In the Italian sense. Uh, in the Italian sense, they were corporative regimes, uh, founded the Carta di Lavoro de Mussolini that forbids unions and institutes the Gremius is the inspiration, and the Catholicism as the political party. So the church plays the role of a political party. In Spain, because they had to defeat the revolution, they had the Falange and the Movimento, which was more organized as a, maybe as more as a classical fascist party. In Portugal, the Catholic Church played this role with no need to a big fascist party, because the Catholic Church was the fascist party in the Gramscian sense. They had a capillarity uh, in the country uh, in order to bring the peasants to proletarianization, because this is what Franco and Salazar do, in, in, in a way that avoids social revolutions. Uh, uh, this is, the, the, I would say, I don't know if I... Yes, in the sense that uh, they, they ended the modernization, the capitalist modernization, bringing the peasants to the cities to work under 
the forbidden of unions, political parties, free speech, and all of that. That is the dictatorships in Iberian uh, Peninsula. But they ended in the most, uh, speaking on an even and combined development, is the anti-colonial revolutions in Africa that started the end of the dictatorships in Iberian Peninsula. And in 74, the Portuguese bourgeoisie had to fly to Brazil because among nine and a half million people, three million were involved in the kind of Soviets uh, in, the, uh, in the Portuguese uh, revolution. Concerning the Arab Spring, and maybe I will join also the question of backwardness. Uh, first of all, I will answer with my opinion and not Neil's, so it's, uh, I, I think this is important. Uh, I think when we take out the, the concept of backwardness, it looks like we are opening to a non-Eurocentric perspective, and I think we are reproducing an extremely Eurocentric imperialist perspective. For example, let's take the case of Gaza nowadays. Uh, we are asking for Palestinian resistance. No, why not? Because it's not possible. They are in the concentration camp being bombed and killed. There is no possible resistance in Gaza in the sense that people are just dying. The resistance, I don't know if I understand well your question, but I would defend this. I think we have to look to the unions in England, in Portugal, in the US, and say, look, when are you going to do a strike to end the genocide? Because we cannot ask this in Gaza, because we are speaking of completely different stages of development. And if we continue to say that all the countries in the world are equal, in the sense that we defend that all human beings are equal, of course I defend this, but imperialism is not about this. Imperialism is about destroying other countries. And when we use the concept, if we forget the concept of backwardness, we also forget something which is very important. It's not just the working classes of the developed countries that are more political, they have more organizations, more uh, leaderships, more intellectuals, whatever. They have more responsibilities over what's going on in the world. It's not just about having more power, it's about having more responsibility. So I think we should be careful with this concept because we are really speaking of different, well, when Trotsky speak about backwardness and Marx and others, they speak about development of productive forces, of course, but also they speak about development of political forces. So, for example, for the Portuguese working class, it was incredible to come to Paris and London and listen to what's going on there. It's not a moral concept when we speak about backwardness. It's not saying that some people are better than the other one. It's about having tools to change it. And of course, nowadays, what we, not nowadays, after the anti-colonial revolutions, what we, have, what we have achieved is the notion of combined struggles, which is highly important. So we cannot understand the Portuguese working class in 74 without looking to the strikes among the forced laborers that were working with their hands and they could not read and speak and they were absolutely essential to understand why the dictatorships ended in the Iberian Peninsula. But we have to merge the two processes. Otherwise we reach to a situation where we, where we are saying uh, uh, somehow we continue to speak about imperialism, but we forgot that imperialism has brought some countries, mainly in Africa, but not just in Africa, to a stage where people cannot survive in the minimum standards. It's not just about, uh, uh, when we look to some of these countries after the 80s, they, they are crossing the Mediterranean, dying, trying to survive. This is what's about imperialism nowadays. So I think, I'm not sure if I'm answering to the two questions, but um, if I add another, uh, another uh, comment on this, uh, when we look to the Israeli situation, the Gaza situation, uh, uh, what we see is obviously the entanglements also with imperialism. So, 
for the first time, I feel that there is a resistance in uh, New York, in London, in Paris, in Berlin, that is threatening the policy of terror that Israel does and is threatening uh, the institutions in US and in London. For the first time, I have the feeling that we are experiencing a movement where Israel cannot continue to do it anymore without having a strong impact in the core country. So, for example, there, was a, there will be a day of strike uh, called by CCOBAS in Italy, a, a union. There are already 20 unions who declare a blockade to Israel. And I think this is the way. So it's how uh, these uh, connections uh, can have, how uh, uh, the, the, the genocide of a, a, a population without anything will, can have a direct impact on the, the power uh, in the main countries. So I think, and uh, we have experienced the defeat of the Arab Spring, it's true, but they also have experienced the Arab Spring. So I think we shall, we, sometimes we are a little bit sad because the counter-revolutions defeat the revolutions, but there are still revolutions. <laughs> So the Arab Spring is not the same as the defeat of the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring has shown, for example, that was, that was the defeat of the most awful dictatorships in Northern Africa was just possible because of the uh, mobilization, the massive mobilization of the populations. And this, in a, this is an experience for the masses, very important. We, they have been ha dozens of years under successive dictatorship, and just in the moment they question, is a moment where, uh, 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 where these um, regimes were defeated. So I think, yes, I think it's a tool for nowadays, um, and should be seen in a nowadays, even, I would say, in a most deep, in more deepened way, I don't know if now I will answer to your question if I understand it properly. Mm -hmm. It's not a historical, and Neil doesn't defend this. Uh, um, uh, it, it's uh, even, I would say, more deepen, uh, deepening the concept in a way how countries are not just, uh, again, in different stage, but in a combined stage. Um, so, what Niels defend, as far as I understood, and I maybe I'm not correct on this, is that uh, the concept is not located in capitalism, but is essentially a concept of, of understanding capitalism and the development of capitalism unequal, unequal between countryside and cities, peasants and workers, backwardness, more developed countries. So it is an essential concept to understand capitalism and the transformation of capitalism, because this was the main question of Neil concerning why we are studying this. It's not just because we want to understand the world, it's because we want uh, to change it. I don't know if I answer properly to all the comments and questions. We have time for one more burning question, but it has to be very concise. Otherwise, we can also just, yeah, end it on that note and go to the signing. So. Thank you. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you.